So I would like to talk about um, um, transient chaotic dimensionality expansion in um, recurrent networks. And uh, this is a work which uh, has mainly been done by Christian Kolb, a PhD student in our lab, and also together with Tobias Kühn, who moved on. He's actually now in, in Paris also. Uh, and uh, as a postdoc, David Dahmen was involved. Um, yeah, as you, as you said, I'm in, um, affiliated to the Institute of uh, Neuroscience and Medicine in, at the Jülich Research Center, um, but also part of the Faculty of Physics and uh, in RWTH Aachen University in Aachen. Um, yeah, I'm mainly doing teaching and uh, the physics uh, and the physics curriculum. Uh, but I also have uh, very uh, interesting collaborations with physicists at, at that site, trying to bridge and bring methods um, from physics also to neuroscience. So you were, as you were asking. Okay, um, so let me start with a, a talk for today. Um, basically, I would like to first give you a bit of motivation how um, we came up to the question of which we wanted to answer, namely, and this motivation comes from from looking at data in macaque cortex, motor cortex. So here you see a UTA array installed um, uh, in the macaque motor cortex, uh, which has 10 by 10 electrodes. And up here you see then the raster plot, which is being recorded within a time stretch of 400 milliseconds. What you get is then a spike count for each of these neurons. And um, what we were just looking at uh, was computing the statistics of these spikes. So just having here the neurons time axis uh, over many trials, so trial one, trial two, and so on. We uh, computed all the spike counts uh, between um, in, for each of these neurons. And then what you can just look at is <clears throat> the pairwise covariance matrix of the spike count Cij, uh, which is just the ordinary definition of a covariance uh, Funct uh, covariance matrix between these counts. And uh, that means for each pair of neurons ij, you get one number. And um, down here, you see now the distribution we got from this as a histogram. So what we found were that some neurons were positively correlated, others were negatively correlated. On average, you have uh, an average which is very close to zero, but this widths seem to be quite remarkable here. And um, uh, and the, the fact that the mean is close to zero has been understood before by the fact that we are in a balanced state. So Carl has basically explained this to us already long ago, that if we are in a balanced state, we are suppressing fluctuations. Uh, and, and there were some works by Alfonso Renard and by also partly we worked on this to under, uh, ex, uh, explain what this has to do with the pairwise correlations. But this width of the distribution here had been, uh, was a, a, a riddle to us. and. Um, and uh, then David Darwin set out to build a theory to understand how this comes about. And here, yeah, I don't want to talk about this particular theory. I just wanted to give you what was our result from this analysis. And uh, what David did was um, he was building a network model. And the most important ingredient of this network model for us now here is this coupling matrix J. It's a kind of effective coupling matrix, linear response. Uh, in measuring in linear response how one neuron influences uh, uh, all the other neurons. Um, and the important property of this coupling matrix, uh, the surprising thing about the theory which David came up with was that it allows you to <clears throat> express this width of the distribution, which we have seen on the previous slide, which is entering here in a kind of normalized version in this equation and related to two other fundamental quantities. One is just the number of neurons in the network N and the other number which is uh, entering here is R, the spectral radius of this effective connectivity matrix. And um, this, uh, so you get a very surprisingly simple relationship. And what this means is, so the spectral radius, what does it measure? So it, it just tells you, if you take this effective connectivity matrix and look at its eigenvalues, you get some complex eigenvalues in the complex plane and you're asking, where are these eigenvalues located and the radius of this cloud of eigenvalues for a random, uh, randomly drawn matrix is what uh, we call the spectral radius here. And um, the theory which David worked out, worked out allows you then to predict what is the width of this distribution as a function of this radius. And what he found is 
that you get a nice divergence here of this width when the spectral radius goes close to one. And now, um, conversely, if you now take this, uh, this width of the distribution from the data, plug it in here, then you can plot what is the spectral radius as a function of the network size. And um, this is the red curve you see here. And if you plug in N network sizes of realistic networks, like 10,000 and beyond, you end up with a spectral radius very close to one. So that means, and a spectral radius very close to one means, okay, you are almost in a linearly unstable regime in these networks. And um, uh, this, of course, then right away triggers the question, okay, what happens at this, when the spectral radius goes to one? And of course, there's this um, very well-known work by Zompolinski, Klisanti, Sommers in 1988, who have studied networks, randomly coupled networks of these rate equations here, such a form where you have a coupling matrix Jij, and um, which is drawn randomly and um, you, uh, and the, this parameter G squared is, or G is actually basically the, the spectral radius of this coupling matrix. And then it is known that if you increase this G beyond the point one, then suddenly the fixed point activity becomes uh, destabilized and uh, you get uh, an ongoing uh, activity in these networks. And if you analyze this in, or they analyze this in much detail and found that this is actually a chaotic dynamic. So this is basically the well-known transition to chaos when you increase your coupling uh, beyond the point G equal one, here you're in the chaotic phase, here you are in the regular phase. We, we went on and, and, and took this model here and, and asked the question, what happens if you would have input to these networks? Let's say here you have some noisy input, white noise we just took. Uh, so you have the strength of this input on this axis and then <clears throat> We could would also get a, a phase diagram and could extend uh, and figure out where when does the network become chaotic. You see that if you increase the noise strength or the drive to the network, then you need to increase the coupling uh, in some relation to it in order to be in the chaotic regime. It's somehow intuitive because driving the system will try to entrain it. It will make it less chaotic. And um, what is was interesting here is is that uh, the spectral radius is not is now not determining anymore the transition to chaos. Here you see here you have a spectral radius slightly bigger than one, but still the dynamics is, is non-chaotic. Um, but we could figure out a, a transition criterion when uh, these networks become cha chaotic, namely at this red line. Now, an interesting point here is that if you're in this vicinity, so here this is the point where the um, spectral radius is exactly equal to one, um, in this vicinity here, which we have found in, on, on from this previous uh, on the previous slide on this experimental data, you you have that the memory capacity of these networks is also optimal. So this white shading here gives you the memory capacity of these networks to memorize a, a past uh, sequential input, and and this is uh, one example of that you get uh, some optimal computational performance at this transition or close to this transition to chaos. And uh, this, of course, has been um, reported in, in many different ways, also in, 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 in other works. So in these rate networks, we have this transition to chaos at some critical coupling strings. And uh, for example, these, if you look at the sequences which are produced by, by such nearly chaotic systems, they become highly complex at this point. It's, it's known since long. We can use these recurrent networks close to this transition as kind of optimal reservoirs and reservoir computing. Um, also, memory capacity in discrete time networks has been um, found in uh, close to this transition to chaos. And also, the trainability of these networks uh, becomes quite high um, if you look at feed forward networks. Um, what all these networks have in common, or in these works, is that you are looking at continuously coupled networks. Maybe I need to flip back once. Uh, what I mean with continuous coupling here in this equation is. Uh, two things. So first thing is you have a, a time continuous derivative here. So it's the continuously evolving function in time. And the other thing is you have a continuous value of your of your uh, state of your neurons, which you're communicating to the other neurons. This is what I mean with continuous coupling. And this makes it particularly nice that you can employ, for example, path integral formalisms, a path integral formalism to understand what is going on in, in these networks. However, um, 
if we now think about how communication takes place in, in, in biological networks, of course, we know that they are communicating with spikes. Let's say when the membrane potential exceeds a certain threshold, this neuron sends out a spike. It's traveling down here, um, the, the axon reaching this neuron and causing a small depolarization. So we have an all or nothing communication. Uh, meaning that the signal is rather a kind of binary signal which is being sent between neurons than uh, an analog signal. And um, Carl has told us that uh, um, in, in his uh, early work here that these binary networks are, um, are typically also, also chaotic. Um, so uh, also, of course, you can partly also um, link um, this chaos which you find in these uh, spiking networks to chaos and rate networks. For example, if you consider um, strong synaptic filtering uh, in, in these networks, then you partly you get something like a rate dynamics. But uh, basically what we wanted to understand is here, how are these, uh, how is the signaling, the discrete versus continuous signaling affecting the dynamics and the, um, also the information processing capabilities and um, trying to get a fair comparison between continuously coupled networks and uh, networks which are discretely coupled. And in order to do this, we basically looked at the binary neuron model um, and wanted to have a formalism which is equally powerful as the one which we have for rate models, namely a kind of path integral formalism or field theoretical formalism, because this is then very versatile in order to do systematic approximations on top. And um, this is what I would like to walk you through uh, in the next couple of minutes. And uh, basically what it starts with is that my, my neuron receives here a sum of uh, of a weighted sum of inputs from the other neurons and the HI is now my the synaptic current which the neuron receives. And uh, in this binary neuron model which we take as a, a, as a placeholder for this discrete coupling, um, so then you pass this uh, variable H into a nonlinear function Psi which is basically the probability of flipping this uh, neuron to the one state, one minus Psi of H is probability of flipping it to the zero state. And these flips don't happen continuously, but they happen at uh, Poisson points in time. So you draw a Poisson process and only at these points in time, you may change uh, the state of the, uh, the neuron depending on the probability given by Psi of H. So as a result, this X is the binary variable, let's say plus minus one or, or zero one, doesn't matter, you can choose either. Um, uh, and it's, it's uh, alternating force and back. And this is a signal which is being transmitted to the other neuron. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a binary all or nothing communication. Um, if you would, so one way to, to treat these stochastic systems, it's of course a, a Markov system. And then you, if you wanted to build a field theory for them, um, the standard way to do is a stoy peliti formalism. However, it has a slight drawback that that the fields which you introduce are slightly non-physical and, and hard to interpret. So we wanted to have something which we can one-to-one to, one to one compare to the rate network to see where the differences are and, and how far these network, network models are different at all. And uh, to do this, what we did is we said, okay, let's, let's just try to, um, try to abstract away all these details which are in here and replace this uh, by a kind of black box or here it's a blue box actually, uh, which just tells you um, replace the mapping from the input current to the output state of the neuron by this box. And the box is just being represented um, as a joint, uh, sorry, a conditional probability distribution of getting the activity X when you got uh, the input current H. And this is being thought of as a functional it's a causal function, so neurons are causal devices, they cannot look into the future. They, uh, the state at some time point must depend on the past of the input current age. And uh, likewise, we can also replace um, the input current given the activity as, uh, and to express this as a joint, or sorry, as a conditional probability distribution of age given X, which then depends on the coupling J. And the idea is, uh, of um, we wanted to build an, uh, a model independent field theory so that we can compare the two different model classes formally um, 
And we, if we just describe our model by this conditional probability, then it would not matter so much for most of the calculations what model it is. Only in the very end, we can plug this in. And then we have the same structure for the series. So this was our, our idea. Um, and uh, the same, therefore, you can do for the rate model. So this is now the Sompulinski and Isomas rate model written in, in one particular form. You see here, you get the same summation of the synaptic inputs. You get the synaptic current, which is then passed through some nonlinear function. And then you need to put this into the solution of a, uh, of a first order differential equation in order to get the state x. And this also we can write as a causal function of x, the output given h. Here, the output is, of course, a continuous function, right? So this is a continuously coupled network. And these two network models, we wanted to compare side by side. Of course, we would not need this model independent formalism for this particular one. Of course, we have, there is this field theoretical formalism, the so-called um, MSRDJ formalism, which you could apply to this particular rate model. But in order to make it comparable to the binary networks, um, we wanted to cast the two into the one and the same framework. Okay, so um, now, uh, so how does this model independent um, field theory look like so so again let's start with the with this part the we have the synaptic summation so we we assume that we have a just a weighted linearly weighted sum of the activities which make up the synaptic current uh, written just as this constraint that h minus j times x um, uh, is is equal to zero you can express this of course by a dirac um, distribution and this dirac distribution um, one can also write in this Fourier representation, so introducing some Fourier variable h hat, multiplying just this bracket here. And um, why we do this is because in this representation, it's, it's particularly nice that this j here um, appears linearly in this exponent of this exponential function, and this will be very handy in, in, in the one or two slides to come. And um, now, uh, for the neuron dynamics, this, so this current is then fed into, into my neuron model. And the neuron, for the neuron model, I just say it's a causal functional, so the, of the output activity given this input current. And I don't fur further specify this. One thing one can say directly is that um, given this input current, the neurons are conditionally conditioned on this input current. They are in, independently activated because there is Besides the synaptic coupling, there is no other kind of coupling between the neurons. This is the assumption here, which is typically the case. Okay, um, so now let me come, come to this point, this linear appearance of this J here. Why did we choose this particular um, representation? Um, so the idea uh, is now, as usual, if one studies systems which depend on, on random parameters, one can hope that they are self-averaging. So what, what we mean with this is typically that if we look at a certain observable, let's say the mean activity in the network, um, let's call it O here, that if I take different realizations of my random matrix, Jij, of my coupling matrix, then typically I'm interested in such observables which don't vary much when I'm drawing different realizations of J. So that means if I would draw a distribution of all my observables as a, as a distribution over random realizations of the couplings, it would be a very peak distribution. So in these very peak distributions are of course very nicely described if you all would know already what the mean value is. So it means let's compute the mean value of this observable. And to compute this mean value of the observable, you basically just need to compute the mean value of your joint distribution O of H, which I was uh, introducing on the last um, slide. And the only point where the J is appearing is in this very little term here, which I would just write here um, separately, namely in this term, where we resolve this Dirac delta in its full representation. So we have the J appearing linearly here. Um, you can now take the, the average over your coupling matrix, let's say for simplicity, is it's just a, a random matrix where the entries are independently and identically distributed with some mean value g bar over n and some variance for each entry g squared over n. And um, if you take this expectation value, 
then um, you get one term which is proportional to the mean of the entries and one term which is proportional to the variance of the entries. The mean term is linear in H hat. This one, uh, the other one is quadratic in H hat. And this what I call R and Q here are just shorthands for, um, so R is then something like the uh, population averaged activity in the network, which just happens to come out here and Q looks like something like the um, population average uh, second moment or, or autocorrelation function, if you want, so of your activity. So this is the reason why, why the, we choose this particular, um, uh, this particular representation for, the, um, uh, for, for this Dirac distribution. Now, um, if one now rewrites, now one can, uh, for these fields R and Q, one can uh, write down, sorry, maybe I need to say something before. So we now can enforce these definitions by introducing some additional helping fields, R hat and Q hat. And then what we get is a joint distribution for this R Q and this R hat and Q hat, which is of a very particular form, namely it's some exponential function, you have factor N, where N is the number of neurons, and then some function S, which depends on these uh, four fields and this function s is given down here and the only important thing to see now here is that the neuron model we have not specified yet it's still here in this abstract form in here it's just this row of x given h um, and uh, and the other important thing is because of this conditional independence so given the input the neurons are behaving independently um, uh, you you get you can also pull out a factor n here and meaning that means that you have an overall factor n here in this exponent so what this means is that if you study very large networks then only the the stationary points of this s will dominate your behavior of the system that means you can just compute the settle points of this s here you can think of this like an action and doing a, a settle point expansion of this action and if you compute now the gradient of of, of this expression and set it to zero, you get out the mean field equations, which look as you would expect them also based on, on ad hoc arguments. So you, you, you would uh, get a mean value for R, which is something related to the mean connectivity times the mean activity of each neuron. And uh, Q looks now like an um, kind of average uh, autocorrelation function. And these are now self-consistency equations, which you need to solve by plugging in these very values up here again and uh, and computing these expectation values, including this row of x given h. So this is a way how we can derive these mean field equations without saying what our neuron model is. And uh, now we can just apply this to um, to the different um, different neurons. And um, what comes out is after a bit of, of algebra is that they obey. If you take the same activation function, that they obey. Um, the very same uh, equation of motion. So here we just chose for simplicity, you know, a, a point symmetric activation function, like in the original Zompolinsky's anti um paper. So then the, the equation for this R field becomes trivial. It's just R equals zero. Uh, but um, the, the um, equation for the field Q takes the, the form for the rate model, this is long, uh, known since long, right? Like this Dompolinsky's anti Sommers solution. It's an equation of motion which is uh, takes a, a form like a Newtonian equation of motion. Here you have the second derivative equal to um, minus the derivative of some kind of potential, depending on this Q. Uh, but also for the binary networks, we could bring this into this very same form. So that means that on this dynamical mean field level, the binary network and the rate network has or base the, the this autocorrelation function here um, or base the very same um, equation of motion. However, what is different is the boundary conditions under which you need to solve this. So the one boundary condition is the same for both. It's just if you wait long enough and look at two time points very far apart, then the autocorrelation function should become flat, of course, because the neurons become independent over long time uh, scales. But um, the other boundary condition is uh, depends on the neuron model. Namely, one is 
for the binary model, we know that the peak value here must be equal to g squared. This is just due to the fact that we um, have this uh, uh, this Ising representation and plus and minus one squared is equal to one. So the second moment of a neuron is just uh, is just fixed, independent of um, uh, of its state. Uh, so therefore, for the binary neuron, we know that here at this point, we have a boundary condition g squared. But for the uh, rate model, we have a different boundary condition. Namely, if we have a noisy rate model, the slope here of this function must be minus d half, where d is the variance of, this, of the driving noise. That means we have slightly different boundary conditions. And if we want to have the very same solution, then of course, we may need to make these uh, equations match. But this can be done. Um, that means one can, for every binary network, one can determine this effective noise D, which I would need in the rate model in order for the autocorrelation functions to be precisely identical. So that would mean that these networks behave in a very um, similar manner on, on this dynamical mean field level. And uh, what this directly implies is something for the chaoticity. So in, in our previous work, we found a condition for um, the transition to chaos in, in rate networks. And this condition looks like this. Uh, um, basically, if the effective variance a neuron receives is bigger than the variance of, the, of its own activity, then the network is chaotic. If the variance it receives is smaller than the variance it sends, it is non-chaotic. Now, however, um, if you now look at this matching, here this q0 is equal to g squared by by, um, by definition of, of choosing the noise D so that this statistics matches. Uh, that means these two are identical, but then having now um, um, an activation function, which is saturating like hyperbolic tangent, which we need to have for binary neurons because it's basically a probability, then this expectation value is necessarily smaller or equal to G squared. That means rate networks with uh, where the, we match the, on the mean field level, the statistics are never chaotic. So what this means is that even though the binary networks may be chaotic, the, if I replace the coupling by a continuous coupling like in the rate network, and if I make sure that the dynamic mean field theory is identical, then this matched rate network is a non-chaotic one. So this we found surprising because we thought, okay, if this is the same, maybe then uh, they should also behave more or less similarly, but, but this was not the case. Therefore, we, um, we, we looked again into, um, into the chaos transition uh, in the binary network in a bit more, more detail, uh, like in, in this approach, which was pioneered by Derrida and Homo, looking at two replicas of, of the net networks, uh, um, network one and network two, and measuring the Euclidean distance between their activities. Um, then, in, as you know, in a, in a regular network, um, if you perturb now the initial condition of the one network with regard to the other one, and you measure this distance, and the two trajectories stay on top of each other, it's non-chaotic. Uh, whereas in a chaotic network, if, even if you change the initial state only a bit, then uh, these two trajectories are diverging apart. And the rate by which they diverge apart is um, in the long time limit is the um, maximum Lyapunov exponent. Okay, so this, of course, um, if you now spell out the square here, you can um, reduce this to the square in the one system and the other system and the mixed term, so in a stationary statistics, these two are constant. So basically it boils down to asking the question, how do these systems decorrelate as a function of time? Or how, how does the correlation between these two systems evolve as a function of time? If they decorrelate, it's chaotic. If they stay correlated, it's non-chaotic. And, um, and now writing this down by use of this, um, in, in, in this generalized um, model independent framework, we ar arrived at a, a at a simple equation, it has uh, um, uh, which which has this particular form. So this is a correlation between these two replicas, Q one two, and um, and it has two terms on the right hand side. One is the correlation between 
the systems. You can think of this like the correlation between the outputs of these replicas. Think of these replicas as two representing neurons. And then you have another term, which you can think of as the correlation, which is going in here. And basically this needs to be solved. Um, you can think of this problem therefore as a problem of correlation transmission. So of a, by a pair of neurons. So basically reducing the question of whether this network becomes chaotic is reduced to the question of if I'm having some correlated input here, is the correlation on the output side bigger or smaller? So if it's bigger then the correlation will grow overall closing the self consistently if it's smaller the correlation will shrink so that means you just need to compare these two functions this one and this one is a linear function the other one has this funny um, uh, square root behavior and this very same square root behavior had been found uh, of course in a, in a very similar analysis by 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 Carl's uh, original work namely um, he was saying that they have an um, infinite Lyapunov exponent because you have this diverging slope here. And um, that means if you now start in a perfectly correlated setting and you decorrelate these systems a bit, then uh, here the gray line is above the black one. That means you will move towards this left point and uh, run into this fixed point here. Whereas if you are on this side, the situation is otherwise is, is reverse and you're running into in this, this fixed point into this most more correlated regime. So what this implies is that um, these binary networks, they ha now have um, a size dependent, network size dependent transition to chaos. So whereas the rate networks, they, the chaos transition depends only on the coupling parameter G, these binary networks, it depends on the network size because if you now look again at this plot here and you start with the perfectly correlated replicas and now you're flipping a single spin in your or a single uh, state of a single neuron in your in your system this corresponds to a certain amount of decorrelation let's say going until here if it corresponds to this amount of decorrelation the black line is below the gray one i'm moving further left into this fixed point meaning i'm decorrelating more so the system becomes chaotic the trajectories go apart however if this decorrelation here would be of this size, you would, uh, and this would correspond to the flip of a single neuron, you would recorrelate and then the system would be, um, would the, the two replicas would become more correlated, meaning it would be regular dynamics. Now, what determines this length here? It's basically this g squared divided by n, because this is the amount of decorrelation caused by flipping a single neuron. In particular, it depends on n, meaning if I have large networks, this is a small stretch, and therefore large networks are always chaotic. Uh, but if, if n becomes sufficiently small, then this can make this quantity larger and, you, uh, and basically the system can, can be regular. So this is uh, what, what is the prediction of the series. So you have here n network size and here you have the coupling strengths and indeed, so this is basically the, the theoretical prediction, this green line between chaotic and regular. And this is what you find in simulation. There's not a a perfect quantitative match between this dynamic mean field and the finite size simulation, but it's uh, it's still pretty good. So here you get regular dynamics in these binary networks. Here you get chaotic evolution. Okay, of course you can then also study this as a function of the coupling g squared and g bar, so mean and and variance of your connections, and um, and compare this between the dynamic mean field and the series. So this seems to work quite quite well. Um, now, what can you get more from this? So remember that um, we, we found just this very um, simple uh, ordinary differential equation, which would express the correlation between the two replicas as a function of time in these um, uh, binary networks. And this was this Q12, so the correlation between the two replicas you could also measure, so to speak, the difference between the correlation between the replicas minus um, the correlation, the perfect correlation. So meaning in this quantity that this difference can be related to how many spins are or how many states of neurons are different between the two. So it's related to the Hamming distance between the two um, state vectors. And this again, you can interpret as a dimensionality of the space, because basically think about it uh, like this. So if you're perturbing one of these networks and, um, and the two trajectories are drifting apart, 
then this distance tells the typical distance tells you basically what is the dimensionality of the space in which these trajectories are can can live or uh, um, which which is the dimensionality of the space which these trajectories are filling so basically you can also see it as a um, dimensionality here written relative to the size of the number of, of, of neurons here and having this fixed point this residual correlation for this q12 which was the fixed point in this equation means that these trajectories don't drift apart completely but they arrive at a certain fixed point level which is below one so here's one so they arrive at a certain fixed point level below mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. fixed point level depends on the strengths of of how strong your, your coupling in the network is. Red dashed line is the, um, uh, is, is the limit of, of G going to infinity. And, um, uh, and here's some upper limit, eight over pi squared. So some, some number which is uh, smaller than, than one for this decorrelation. And the other thing you need to note is that the dynamics of this decorrelation is very stereotypic. It does not depend strongly on G, so this transient behavior always happens on a very comparable time scale related to the time scale of my neurons tau. Now if we do the same analysis for this decorrelation in rate networks then the situation looks qualitatively different. First of all these curves here decorrelate always completely so they basically there is not, um, not a finite dimensional subspace which is spent by the trajectories but it's always spending the full available space. And it's, if you study this as a function of the coupling strengths of your neurons, this decorrelation, um, then, uh, then uh, you see a very strong dependency in mind, this um, logarithmic time scale here. So that means here we get a kind of stereotypic expansion of this dimensionality of this space. And we were asking, uh, asking ourselves then if this can be useful for anything. And um, Basically, what we then did is we just used these binary networks and and use them in the in the reservoir computing setting. So we we initialized, um, let's say, L a fraction of all the neurons in some initial state, some random binary vector, at time point zero. Then we let the dynamics run, and at a later time point, capital T. We then try to classify which of the different patterns we had presented as this initial condition. So pattern one, pattern two, until pattern P. And uh, but we did this by training one linear classifier, um, you know, the linear readout W for each of these patterns presented. And um, then somehow the uh, intuitively the idea would be since we have this um, transient expansion of this dimensionality, as we saw on, on one of the last slides. Uh, this may be useful in order to do this, uh, to help classification, because of course, if you're in a low dimensional space, like in a one dimensional space, and you want to separate the red from the blue points, um, this is uh, impossible here by a linear separating line. However, if you lift these three points into a two-dimensional space, then of course you can nicely separate them. So, um, and, uh, and similar things should happen here in these networks. And this we looked at uh, in, in a bit more detail, namely um, here you see now this dimensionality of this representing space of this signal. So green is the average distance between two different patterns. And the red curve is the average distance between the one noisy version of this same stimulus and another noisy version of the very same stimulus. Now, the interesting thing is that um, this, this green curve is slightly above the red curve, which is so if, of course, you, if you have more noise than signal, then it's the other way around. But typically, you have a slightly less noise than your signal it means that the green curve has a head start and, uh, and, the, and the red curve comes a bit later and if one does a bit of linear algebra and thinks about how what is the signal which a linear decoder has then it is directly related to the difference of the dimensionality spent by the signal minus the dimensionality corrupted by noise somehow the number of informative uh, coordinates you can think of divided by the number of patterns. This is coming out as an approximation if you assume these representations to be approximately orthogonal. The theory is given as this dashed line here for the signal as a function of time. 
And this has now a peak because the difference between the red and the blue, uh, sorry, the green and the, um, and the red curve has a peak here. This is just this peak which is inherited. And um, the theory uh, qualitatively explains the behavior you see also in simulations. And the interesting thing of this curve is if you take the limit of very weak noise, then uh, this curve looks very stereotypic. It doesn't change much as the function of the coupling strings. In particular, the peak here is to a very good approximation always at 2 ln 2 with regard to the time constant of the neurons. 2 ln 2 is something like 1.4, meaning that the optimal time to wait in these networks is when every neuron has fired approximately 1.4 times. So which is meaning each neuron needs to fire only on, on average 1.5 spikes or 1.4 spikes in order for um, the network to have the optimal representation of the stimulus to do this classification independent of the coupling strings. Okay, um, and uh, basically the last thing we then looked at, okay, is this a general phenomenon? So we've studied this also in, in, in leaky integrate and fire networks. These are now LIF simulations stimulating with one pattern, with another pattern. You get a qualitatively a similar um, looking plot for the difference between the signal, so the signal dimensionality and noise dimensionality, the difference having also a peak here. And um, if you know, therefore your readout signal also has this characteristic peak and the classification performance um, becomes here in, in particular, it becomes even perfect within this time span related to this, um, to this peak here. So this means this is a, seems to be a, um, a general, general, very fast way of, of expanding the dimensionality of a, of a signal into this high dimensional space, which is intimately related to the discrete coupling of these networks. So in rate-based systems, uh, you don't have this stereotypical behavior. Okay, so with this, I would first like to, to thank um, uh, mainly, so the main work was done by Christian Kolb uh, and, and Tobias Kühn, so Christian Kolb and, um, and, and Tobias Kühn. David Dahmen uh, was also strongly involved as the postdoc and I would like to thank the, the funding uh, and uh, maybe a very brief remark uh, for those who are interested in, in these field theoretical approaches to neural networks. We recently could summarize our lecture notes, which was held regularly in Aachen. Um, you'll find them in some version on archive. If you prefer a printed version, you can also get it now as the Springer lecture notes in physics. Also, the field theoretical derivation of the Sompolin cycles and the Sommer theory is, is contained in there, including the chaos computation. And um, with that, I would like to summarize. So, in the very first, for the motivation, I, I showed you that we have um, in data we find wide distributions of correlations, which relate uh, to the fact that we um, have a spectral radius very close to to one. Um, and uh, then I, I showed you that we can, can build a model independent fi uh, field theory for binary and rate networks, which uh, allows you to get the very same dynamical mean field theory so that you can compare them side by side. And uh, in uh, these discretely coupled, so binary networks, we found uh, network size dependent transition to chaos and this very stereotypical expansion of dimensionality of represented stimuli, which can be used for fast classification in these uh, networks. So basically rate and binary networks you can see as two mutually exclusive classes concerning chaos because if you match the statistics of a rate network to the statistics of a binary network, then it is non-chaotic. So meaning the chaos which is in the binary network is of a completely different kind than the rate chaos you have in the rate network. Okay, so with this, I would like to um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>